Hey, and welcome to the highlights of episode number 151 with Dr. Kelly Brogan. Some of my favorite parts of this episode were when she shares how to heal your depression in one month. Yep, you heard me right, one month. I also loved when she shared about how to reprogram your thoughts for epic health and happiness, and when she shares the most powerful detoxification tool on the planet. But there is so much more knowledge, wisdom, and inspiration that you get in the full episode. So to listen to the full podcast and get all the info in the show notes, head on over to melissaambrosini.com forward slash 151 right now. Welcome, Kelly. I am so excited to have you on the show. Can you share a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you are today and doing the work that you do in the women's health space? Yeah. So I I think the most interesting part of my story is that I used to be my own foil, meaning like, you know, in Shakespearean terms, I used to be the very definition of, of what it is that I position myself, you know, as an alternative to, let's say, I, you know, went to medical school because I had worked a suicide hotline in college where I went to a college called MIT, where there, you know, there are unfortunately a lot of completed suicides. It's a very big issue for a number of reasons. And I also was a neuroscience major. So I really, you know, I I took the bait and I believed that we had cracked the code on human behavior. And all we need is to make sure more and more people have access to psychiatric medications. We have to get them into treatment. So I went to medical school for that purpose, became very impassioned about, you know, psychopharmacology and, confident using multiple medications in patients to the extent that my specialization was in pregnant and breastfeeding women, medicating them. So I was, you know, one of the early, actually first 300 doctors on the planet to specialize in such a thing. And it really wasn't until I encountered my own health crisis, which was a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis postpartum, my, my own first pregnancy, that I really you know, started to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, learning what it is that conventional medicine has to offer and, and finding that wasn't satisfactory for me. You know, I didn't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life. And I was called to explore something I had only ever dismissed up until that point, which was naturopathic medicine. I wanted to know if I hadn't been told anything else. And so I, I endeavored to educate myself, uh, you know, about what it was that I wasn't taught. And that was the beginning of the end of my conventional practice, which was really sealed by a book called Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker, who's an intrepid journalist. And he basically helped me to understand something I was ready to hear. And that's important. You know, right timing is everything. I was ready to hear that there's something curious about the trends in the prescribing of psychiatric medication because we have more access to treatment and more people being treated with these medications than ever before in human history. So why is it that we actually have more disability, mental health disability, than ever before in human history? Shouldn't those be inversely correlate? He concluded that it's actually the treatment itself that is perpetuating epidemics the world over. And we, you know, we need to go back to the drawing board. And so that led me to put down my prescription pad. I never started a patient on medication again after 2010. Wow. That's, that's huge. That is huge. And something that we see prescriptions being written out for more and more and more, and it's getting scarily, it's just increasing so much is the mental health and the, the depression. And it's something that we need to talk about and something that you talk a lot about. So you say that the cause is not this chemical imbalance in the brain, which a lot of people believe is the case. So if that's not the case, what is the case then? Yeah. So, so we've been told a story. It's, it's a story that is a, is a familiar and comfortable one to us, which is that you are born with it, mm. right? So never mind the fact that many decades of Research and, and taxpayer dollars have gone towards finding the gene, for example, for depression or schizophrenia or OCD or bipolar, you name it, uh, autism. And we've come up completely empty handed. I mean, beyond empty handed, like not even really a shred, you know, to, to, to hang a scientific theory on. 
So we've been told this story that it's it's genetic and it emerges at some point in your life. And after that point, you have to manage your symptoms like a good patient and take your meds forever, right? So of course it makes sense that you would consider availing yourself of an option that promises stability, that promises to to resolve your symptoms in, in a matter of weeks. And so that's really, you know, where my where and why my sword is aloft, because I think that everybody needs to at least know what is possible so that they can make an informed choice about what resonates with their belief belief system, what is right for them. Mm. So what are the lifestyle contributing factors to depression and mental health? All of these seemingly separate systems are inextricably connected. And so the, the discipline is called psychoneuroimmunology. And the, what it explores and, and studies is the role of inflammation as a messenger, as the language that the body uses to express imbalance, express perceived stress or threat. And, you know, so it's not a bad thing. It's actually the body's wise adaptation to something that is wrong. So what's wrong, right? In the literature, it's called an evolutionary mismatch that we evolved over time in concert with the natural world and that that our being has a certain environmental context that it thrives in, right? Certain amount of sunlight and movement, certain nutrients and a relationship to food and the microbiome, not only in our, our food, but in the, in the living soil, you know, certain ways of orienting towards our community, of uh, feeling held certain ways of, of relating from parent child and you know certainly certain ways of thinking right and relating to demands and and perceived stressors the amazing thing to me is that you can repair and recover your body and subsequently your mind and spirit in the space of sometimes a month i mean i have outcomes in my practice and in my online program that you know, my approach is, is really a month-long intensive, there shouldn't be much of anything that happens in a month, right? Because most of us are sick for sometimes years, just stuck circling the drain. So, so why would we ever expect to feel differently in a month? Well, that's the result of sending the body and the mind and the spirit signals of safety from many different directions simultaneously. And that's what I've found is, is really, you know, the key to unlocking the innate potential for for healing. How do we send our body those signals of healing? Like, how do we actually do that? Because I'm sure there's lots of people listening going, oh my gosh, I really want to do this. You know, I'm feeling stuck and unwell. So how do we send our body those signals? Yes. So, you know, my approach and program, online program, really begins with, you know, so a lot of people come to the program, it's called Vital Mind Reset. A lot of people come to it because they want to get started on the diet, right? And they want guidance and meal plans, and whatever. And so they're kind of confused why the first two weeks of the program is essentially focused on <laughs> brainwashing. <laughs> it's essentially focused on making sure that there is a belief system firmly in place to translate the gifts of lifestyle medicine into robust and radical outcomes. Because I know, you know, not from my own, you know, sort of hope and wish, I know from the literature itself and my understanding of the role of what's called expectancy, which is the power of what you believe is going to happen literally is the most important determinant in a medical outcome. This is in surgery. This is in pain medication. This certainly in psychiatry is very strong, that signal. Sometimes it's called the placebo effect, but that, you know, tends to be misleading because people think, oh, placebo effect, I'm going to be fooled into thinking something. It's not that. It's actually the power of our mind to shape our biology. And, you know, there are many, you know, thought pioneers like Bruce Lipton who have, you know, paved this path and it's it's no longer the realm of like woo-woo you know, new aginess. So that is a very important ingredient. Like, what do you believe about your body? Do you think it's like a broken machine? Or do you think that it actually does have an innate wisdom that conventional medical science has no capacity to capture? 
And that if we just tap into that, it knows exactly what to do. We just have to create the conditions. And then what comes next is really just a choice. It's a commitment, you know, and, and I believe that anybody can make that commitment. And actually, you know, many might be surprised to learn that the women that I work with, you know, one-on-one, the outcomes that are, are most dramatic are in the sickest people that I work with. So, you know, the people who are headed to state hospital, the people who are just coming off of electroconvulsive therapy, who are on five meds for 25 years, multiple suicide attempts, you know, you would think that lifestyle medicine is for like, if you have a little anxiety, you know, or a little brain fog, and it is for that, but it's also, you know, a major medical intervention. <laughs> and so, so what has to come and what does come in those people is, is the commitment and the choice to give yourself this month long experience. What I find is that first comes the physical healing. It's the lowest hanging fruit. Just start there right? So your symptoms may have a deep metaphysical significance, you know, may reflect something even about like lineage level, ancestral, you know, trauma. However, let's not start there, you know, and and let's just start with the, with chopping wood, carrying water and, and healing the physical body in all of its merciful grace that it allows us to, you know, heal it in, in the space of a month. So we start there. My, you know, sort of, introduction to meditation was because I had healed my body. And then I began, you know, my spiritual awakening began, uh, which is what I see in almost every person I, I, you know, work the system with, so to speak. And I came to Kundalini yoga. So I am am certified in, in Kundalini yoga and Kundalini works with different intervals of meditation. So I work with the three minute interval. So it's a three minute commitment every single day, no exceptions. Like if you're laying down in bed and you're like, oh God, I didn't do it today. You sit up in bed and you do it every day, every day. Otherwise the month starts over, the clock starts over. And then the, you know, the final piece is really getting, you know, educated about detoxification. So, you know, detoxing your products to just, you know, sort of choosing this laundry detergent versus that one. How do you, how should I filter my water? What about my air? Do I live in an urban area? Should I put a, you know, a bunch of, breathing plants in my space. And then to begin to look at whether or not you need extra support with regard to detox, detoxing your body. And so this is where something I'm now notorious for is where the coffee enema comes in. And I learned this from my mentor. I never would have adopted it. Otherwise, I think I probably would have been very skeptical about it. But, you know, he showed me research from the New England Journal of Medicine back, you know, dating back to 1952 where the coffee enemas were used to resolve psychotic symptoms and schizophrenic patients with no other interventions in a two week period, you know, and, and, you know, where coffee enemas were used in the ICU setting, for example, and were in the Merck manual and are now, you know, or were taken out actually in the seventies because of space considerations. And now of course they're, you know, demonized and they're dangerous and everything else. And that's fine, you know, and, and, and I don't think they should be used sort of like willy nilly. And I am very, you know, loyal to, to his instructions, but in the right setting with the right, you know, guidance, you know, in the right program, they are extremely powerful detox methodology. I think the most powerful, you know, so, so this is an example of how we, we enter through the the mind, through the gut, you know, we, we cocoon ourselves in a home environment that feels safe. And we begin to send, use nutrigenomics, use the informational capacity of food to send those signals of safety every day. You know, we all know that our gut is our second brain and that whatever's going on in there is going to be reflected in our life and in our health. So what are the repercussions if we don't start to heal our gut and look after our gut? Like what is going to happen? What are the repercussions? So my assumption is that every person who is struggling with symptoms of mood imbalance, anxiety, agitation, insomnia, fatigue, you name it, that comes under the umbrella of psychiatric symptomatology has leaky gut, has intestinal permeability and what's called dysbiosis, which actually etymologically means wrong way of living. Isn't that funny? I love that when I learned that, that that's actually what dysbiosis means is another word for imbalance in primarily our understanding is that gut bacteria 
But there are many other microorganisms that play, you know, there are archaea and fungus and, you know, there's the virome now we understand that we are composed of, of the very things that we've been demonizing and pathologizing. So there's a lot of poetry embedded in our understanding of the importance of the ecology of our gut. And I think that, you know, most people intuitively understand that the, the brain and mind affect the gut, that, you know, we've been nervous and we have butterflies or, or we have to give, you know, a speech and we have like diarrhea or we fall in love and, and we, we lose our appetite. But I think that it's, it, it's taking a lot more convincing and a lot more science to get people on board with the impact of the gut on the brain directly. So this is what we call a bi-directional relationship. So it goes both ways. And that's why, you know, the, the capacity of gut healing to influence mood, cognition, and behavior is not to be underestimated. It's, it's incredibly strong. And it's also the primary, you know, route of access. And it's designed that way, you know, that our alimentary canal begins at our mouth, ends at our anus, that that is our primary means of relating to our environment. It's informational. And that's why, you know, calorie perspectives on diet or ta- talking about food as fuel, you know, it's just it's, it's so diminishing of what actually is the nature of, of that relationship. And so, you know, there's so many ancient, you know, healing modalities and approaches that have told us that the, the seat of, of health is the gut, you know, that this is, this is the place to start. And it's, it's because, you know, it's responsible for digestion for some estimates, 70 to 80% of our immune system contained in our gut for nutrient synthesis, you know, that actually our relationship to these microbes, that they actually make nutrients that oftentimes we can't synthesize. They, you know, are able to interact with the environment in ways that are, are really synergistic. And besides doing your one month course to really heal the whole body, what are some things that people can do today to heal our gut? Yeah. So, I mean, to my mind, I mean, we, we were joking about it earlier in, in the show, but starting with breakfast is a really empowering place to begin. Because if you start your day and you interact with your, you know, your stress hormone rhythm, the beginning of your day with the right kinds of food for blood sugar balance, you know, that are anti-inflammatory, that are providing dense nutrients, then your mental space, right? Your energy and your experience of satiety during that first part of the day, are you have a leg up on all of that. And so that can feed forward, of course, into the rest of your day and may help you, you know, to begin to connect the dots. So like, let's say you have that smoothie for breakfast and then you know, for lunch, you have a bagel and then an hour and a half later, you're tired and irritable and you have a headache. Well, you have more data now, you know, about how your, your experience in your body is being directly influenced by the foods that you're interacting with. 